every year for the last two years, I've been asked to give a, a lecture of some kind, a presentation to the alumni. Uh, and choosing these topics is always a little tricky because, of course, quite a bit has happened in history. I've, I've chosen the idea that I should perhaps do something on the 100th or other appropriate anniversary of, of some important historical event. This year it was a very hard decision because, of course, as you all know, today is the 70th anniversary of the start of Operation Overlord in Normandy. Uh, but I thought that was being commemorated sufficiently without my few words uh, to be added to that. It's also approximately the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's first abdication, which took place in April of 1814, and of the Battle of Chippewa in July of 1814, which is famous because uh, finally in the War of 1812, in which the United States was fighting Britain, the American army managed to win a battle, uh, which was uh, about time. However, uh, we are just three weeks away from an event of such earth-shaking importance, almost literally, uh, that I thought that it should be today's topic, and that, of course, is the events in uh, Sarajevo, Bosnia on June 28, 1914, and the subsequent uh, catastrophes that resulted from that. Uh, this event began a process by which, in a little over a month, Europe would begin uh, destroying itself, essentially, and beginning a process that hasn't ended yet, which certainly led to the decline of Western civilization. Uh, furthermore, um, even though Americans are not as interested in Europeans as the First World War, in the First World War, mainly because we had less of a role to play in it than they, uh, starting in about three weeks, you will be certainly bombarded, <laughs> so to speak, uh, from time to time with information on this or that event in World War I, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of material on how it started, and I thought that this presentation might be not a bad idea to uh, give you some firm historical data uh, compared to what you might see in the uh, less specialized media. Uh, we call these lectures back to school. That's what it says on the daily, uh, on the, on the, the schedule. Uh, and of course, that's very appropriate for today because all of you studied this in school. Uh, all of you will remember some of this. Some of you may remember a lot of it. And if there's any historians here, uh, I apologize for all the things I have to leave out. But uh, this is a lot of material to cover in 45 or 50 minutes. Um, as far as the uh, PowerPoint presentation goes, I have had some somewhat lighthearted captions on a few of these. Uh, I did that primarily because this is such a grim subject that if I didn't, uh, no one would enjoy the rest of the weekend. So uh, I don't wish to make light of these catastrophes, but nonetheless, there has to be a little bit of comic relief uh, occasionally. Here we go. Uh, if I'm going on and if you have any questions, please stick up your hand. There'll be a time for questions at the end if anyone wishes to ask them. You've all seen this map, Europe in 1914 in school. You've seen it more than once. Uh, this map that always shows the two alliance system, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy uh, in the Triple Alliance, uh, United Kingdom, England, France, and Russia in the Triple Entente, uh, Serbia, likely the ally of Russia, Montenegro, the ally of Serbia, and the rest of these countries usually shown as neutral, although some were more neutral than, uh, than others. Um, as I say here, neither alliance was as solid as it appears, and in order to understand what happened, you have to be aware of that. Um, Germany and Austria were tied very closely together by the dual alliance, the defensive alliance, and if either was attacked, the other would come to her assistance. Uh, this map also reminds us of the interesting problem faced by Austria with these ethnic groups, which I'll be talking more, a little bit more about in a moment. Italy, however, uh, was not nearly as firm as a member of the alliance as the other two. Italy had joined this alliance because they were angry at France when in France in 1888 had taken Tunisia, which Italy wanted. But you can only stay angry at someone about taking Tunisia uh, for so long. And since what the Italians really wanted was Italia Irredenta, the areas of Tyrol and Trieste and Fiume that belonged to Austria, but which were still under, uh, that belonged to Austria, but contained many Italians, uh, there was a feeling in Italy that they really As far as the other three goes, Russia and France were bound together by one of the simplest and most drastic and direct treaties in history. Uh, the entire military alliance between France and Russia can be printed on one sheet of paper. Here it is printed on one sheet of paper. And the operative paragraphs, which I invite you to read, are here. You do not have to be Metternich or Bismarck to understand the purpose and the meaning of this treaty. It is very, very straightforward. Uh, it is designed to deal with Germany in the event that Germany should cause
cause troubles in either France or Russia. If the forces of the Triple Alliance or the partners of that alliance should mobilize to get ready for war, France and Russia will do so immediately and move their armies as close as possible to the frontier. It even specifies how many men the, Ger the French and Russians will employ initially against Germany, which is very unusual for a treaty of this kind, but the French especially wanted to nail down the numbers, at least 1.3 million Frenchmen, seven to 800,000 Russians. Uh, some of you might say, was the Russian army bigger? Yes, it was, but about half the Russian army was assumed would be fighting Austria, Germany's ally, leaving this number available to fight Germany. Uh, this was a very firm treaty. It says later that this treaty will last as long as the Triple Alliance. So it was designed specifically to deal with Germany if Germany was at all uh, aggressive. Um, treaties like this tend to make countries very touchy. Uh, they tend to aim at any small event to become bigger, to mobilize, to announce that you're calling up your reservists, to get armies ready for war, which is absolutely essential to fight a war. It's still true today. Uh, to one country to mobilize meant that others would have to mobilize, or they might get caught flat-footed, unprepared, while their opponents were prepared. Um, these things can cause problems. And the area in which they would probably cause problems in Europe in 1914 is this marvelous area that is still causing problems, uh, known as the Balkans. Uh, most people don't remember, unless they're from the Balkans, that there were two wars in the Balkans in 1912 and 1913, just before uh, World War I. It's called very cleverly the First and Second Balkan Wars. In the First Balkan War, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, Albania and Montenegro all agreed on something, which is very rare, namely that they hated the Turks. And the Turks, who still held large areas of the Balkans, were defeated and driven out to the very gates of Constantinople, which is here. In fact, the Turks were driven back to about here when the great powers said, that's enough. As a result, the Balkan peoples were on a nationalist roll. They had won great territories. They had crushed their historic enemy, these Turks who had been in the Balkans for 500 years. And then, since this is the Balkans, immediately after uh, the First Balkan War, uh, the winners quarreled among themselves as to who would get what, and the Bulgarians decided to try to take some territory from the Serbians with the result that Serbia, Greece, and Romania, which had made, remained peaceful up to this point, all attacked Bulgaria and took territory from Bulgaria. Uh, this territory is here, the Croatic out here, and the Rusia around here, uh, pretty well alienating Bulgaria. Now, most nationalistic Serbs said if we can triple the size of our country, because before the war, the border was about here. Next, we could add Bosnia from Austria, this area here that has one-third of its population as Serbs. However, they really couldn't do that easily because Austria had annexed Bosnia in 1908 and forced Serbia to sign a treaty saying they didn't mind this happening. But this is going to cause some problems because nationalist Serbs in Bosnia who regard themselves as Serbian citizens, even though in fact they're Austrian citizens, uh, are going to make violent efforts uh, to break away from Austria. If some of this sounds like some stuff that's still going on today, and it's going to seem more that way as we get going, that's why we study history, is to try to see if we can come up with solutions that work better or in some cases as well uh, as the ones that originally uh, have originally occurred. Um, the task of the civilized powers now, of course, was well illustrated in this cartoon. Uh, to keep the lid on, we have Russia, drawing gold from Britain, Germany, Austria, and France trying to prevent the Balkan troubles from exploding. Obviously, there was some trouble with doing this in 1914. They had done enough in 1914. Most people thought they probably would continue uh, to do it, but they could only do it if they cooperated. And, well, we're going to see that the cooperation sort of broke down. Uh, Serbia was especially a country that needed to be watched. It was a violent place. Uh, in 1903, Certain army officers got very tired of the king of Serbia, King Alexander, partly because of his unpopular wife, his second wife, Queen Draga, and partly because he had this crazy idea of being friendly with Austria, figuring that if you were hostile to Turkey, which they always were, you ought to be friendly with the other great power on your border. And as a result, these Serbian officers <coughs> tried to effect what we would call regime change. Uh, there is the uh, king and the queen, and this is a king. Uh, they simply dynamited the gates of the royal palace, marched inside, shot everybody in sight, which included several cabinet ministers, and then they stabbed them to make sure they were dead, threw the bodies out on the lawn, washed them off with a hose, and that was the end of the royal family. They then sent a telegram to the head of the other 
royal family, the rival of the royal, the royal family, the Karadurgviches, uh, and this guy lived in Paris. He was no dummy, as you may have told me, uh, and told him he could now come and be king. But when he did arrive, this elderly gentleman, he obviously wasn't going to have too much uh, political say because he was afraid of uh, people getting his fists. And that was a problem with Serbia. How do you control the country, uh, a nationalistic, aggressive country? I haven't time to go through all of the leaders of Europe, but there's a few that need to be mentioned that you've all heard of. Uh, the first is this man here, the man who in this country was often called Kaiser Bill during the uh, Great War. Uh, and I've picked two of a uh, very large number of available portraits of this, uh, this man, one a painting and one a photograph here. The Kaiser is often pictured as this lunatic warmonger and saber rattler and man eager for war and this bloodthirsty Hun. Uh, this man was probably more hated in the United States by 1917 than Hitler was until the discovery of the camps at the end of World War II. In fact, however, the Kaiser uh, was a reasonably intelligent and reasonably peaceful uh, man who had no particular evil intentions towards anyone but, as you can judge from this, he didn't have much common sense. He inherited the throne at the age of 28 when his father unfortunately died of throat cancer three months after he came to the throne, Frederick III, and you wouldn't forget about him. But the Kaiser never really grew up in many ways. The Kaiser continued uh, to act as he liked, to say things that he never should have said, uh, to wear these flamboyant costumes, which he often changed two or three times a day, and to insist on being addressed by such titles as all highest warlord and things like that. This was not good PR. When the ruler of a major European power, the country with the strongest army, says to military recruits, as the Kaiser did say once, remember, in this time of social unrest, if I give the order, you may have to shoot down your parents, your brothers, and your sisters. The Kaiser was always afraid of a social uprising in Germany, which had no chance of actually happening. Um, this doesn't sound too good, does it? That doesn't look good in the newspapers. Uh, when he tells soldiers going off to the put down the Boxer Rebellion in China, remember, we Germans are descended from the Huns, which is not true, uh, and you must so conduct yourselves that no Chinaman will dare look you in the face. This doesn't look too good. He needed a PR man. He had alienated his closest relatives. This man was half English. His grandmother was Queen Victoria. His mother was Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, Victoria. He spoke excellent English. He visited his grandparents. He was a member of the British royal family. Uh, but what does he do? He builds up the German Navy to a point where the British feel threatened, and he often made anti-British statements, rather like a little annoying adolescent who wants to attract attention to himself. A lot of the Kaiser's personality was he was not exactly harmless, but he was a decent man. However, his conduct was not so good. He certainly didn't like the French, however. He had excellent, uh, excellent political guidance at the start of his reign, but he soon put an end to that, this cartoon you may have seen. In 1890, two years after he inherited the throne, he and the greatest diplomat in European history, Otto von Bismarck, quarreled. They fell out with each other, and the elderly Bismarck left. Famous cartoon by the English cartoonist Peniel shows what happened. The skilled pilot who has steered the ship is leaving, watched by the uh, young captain up here. Uh, Bismarck's departure was particularly tragic because he was replaced by uh, second rate men, uh, by people who wanted to make a name for themselves but had been held back by Bismarck, uh, and by the ambitious and inglorious Kaiser. This was not good. Uh, the Germans, of course, like every other European country, were preparing for the coming of war. In fact, the fact that they were always preparing for its coming, some suggest, almost guaranteed that it would come. Count Alfred von Schlieffen, chief of the general staff, during the years indicated, faced a dilemma. The dilemma was that Russia was on one side of him and France was on the other. And if they both attacked at once, which as you saw earlier is exactly what they were planning to do, uh, things could go badly for Germany. So he came up with a famous plan that is named after him, the Schlieffen Plan, by which 90% of the German army would be concentrated on the Western Front and only a skeleton force left facing the Russians because the Russians were slow to mobilize. And if the Russians did invade Germany, the first thing they came to was East Prussia, which is militarily worthless. It's laid some trees for the most part. Uh, also, it's very hard to defeat Russia. If you advance uh, 100 miles into France, you've taken Paris. If you advance 100 miles into Russia in 1914, <laughs> it's still in Poland. And therefore, it was thought by throwing the bulk of the, Russia, the German army in this turning movement, here's a, a channel with Cleveland, down like so on both sides of Paris, they would crush the French against their own fortifications while the French 
who were attempting to take back the lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine, which Germany had taken in 1871. Uh, this operation did involve a couple of little diplomatic complications, like the invading of Belgium, a country that had had its neutrality guaranteed by every country in Europe in 1837, uh, the invasion of the southern part of Holland, and the overrunning of Luxembourg. But what is that compared to military victory? It is necessary that the French people be through this, uh, even if it brings other countries into the war. Cleveland's successor, von Moltke, modified the plan so the first army would not go through Holland, it would go up to Holland, so Holland's neutrality would not be uh, violated. Every country had military plans. We're not going to look at these military plans because the interesting thing about all the military plans at the start of World War I is that none of them worked. Not one. They all went wrong, including the Schlieffen plan. But this one, you must know, because of course it directly influenced German diplomacy. This was the plan. The assumption was the war in Europe involving Germany means invading France. That was the only plan that the general staff had made in any detail, the Schlieffen plan. Austria-Hungary. The fact that the country has a hyphenated name and that the emperor has two titles, emperor and king, tells you about this interesting place. In 1860, by a compromise of 1861, uh, they had divided the country internally into Austria and Hungary. Germans were about 25% of the population of the country. Magyars, Hungarians, about 20. And the rest were many other groups. They were presided over uh, by this uh, governor, shown as the young ruler, an aged ruler. Francis Joseph I, by eight, 1914, was in his early 80s. And although he still got up at 4 o'clock every morning to do paperwork all day, However, that included two prime ministers, the Austrian and the Hungarian prime ministers. In fact, they had two of everything except the foreign minister and military commander and the ruler. In times of crisis, one man who knows what he wants can sometimes get it, and this man knew what he wanted. This is Franz Conrad von Hetzendorf, commander in chief of the Austrian army. And what I wrote up there, do you have a problem of any kind, solve it by invading Serbia, is not really a joke. This man recommended invading Serbia at least 15 times in the 20th century before he finally got his way. However, he was no warmonger or madman or lunatic by no means. He was a highly intelligent and thoughtful soldier. It is said he was about the only Austrian <coughs> soldier who could speak to most of the people in the army, since the army means half a dozen languages, although German is the only word for man. He simply considered that Serbia seemed to be a terrorist state directly on its border. Uh, the capital of Serbia, you could throw a stone into from Austria, if you could throw a stone across the border and that they had to have regime change, as we would say, that something had to be done because of the situation in the Balkans, which I'll explain in a minute. However, he was willing to risk a major war in order to get at Serbia, and he will finally get his way in 1914. This reminds you of the problem with Austria-Hungary, uh, this crazy quilt country with Germans, Magyars, Czechs, Poles, and Cubans, Romanians, Croats, Serbs, Slovaks, Slovenians, Italians, and probably a few others that we didn't have room for. Here is where you find the Serbs in Bosnia, Serbia is right here. This map is outdated. It was the Ottoman Empire by 1914, as we saw. It isn't there anymore. It's, uh, it's, it's gone away. And Serbia is right here, like that. How do you hold together a country with this many nationalities, languages, different religions, where most of these groups don't especially like each other and some want independence? Uh, well, in the long run, you don't, actually, not in an age of nationalism. Uh, but naturally, the authorities in Austria were trying to hold it together as best they could. And one way would be suppress the anti-Austrian sentiments in Bosnia by uh, having a Serbia that was somewhat friendlier than the one before, because the Serbs were not friendly, as we'll see in a moment. Another major power is this one, as some of you all recognize. If being a good czar meant looking like one, this is one of the greatest czars who ever lived. Nicholas II, a fine man, a good family man, and a good family to be a man of, his wife, his four lovely daughters, and his unfortunate son, Alexis. What was Alexis's problem? Amelia. Amelia, that's correct. Uh, if the Tsar had been able to confine himself to the family circle, uh, he was a wonderful man. Nobody who met him could possibly have disliked this gentle, kind man. Ironically, however, this is the one ruler in Europe who really does have absolute power. His word is law. They, they have a parliament. They have a constitution since the revolution of 1905. But frankly, the Tsar had all the power. And yet this hesitant and rather timid man is really unfit to rule Russia. Russia had enough internal problems without a major war. Uh, I just wanted to add, since everyone knows who that is, 
that he has nothing whatsoever to do with the stuff we're studying today. Nothing. He wasn't even in St. Petersburg. Rasputin's influence in the Russian government, although he's been there for a while, doesn't come in until 1915, late 1915, when he has serious influence. But that's why you won't be hearing him. He has nothing to do with the start of World War I. I think Sean's already explained to you before that. Now down to the Balkans. When the Austrians annexed Bosnia in 1908, and forced the Serbians to say they didn't mind, that this caused the formation or the expansion of an organization dedicated to driving the Austrians out. This organization is usually called the Black Hand, or Union or Death. The Black Hand was not a charitable organization. That's its seal. Skull and crossbones, bomb, dagger, poison bottle. Yeah. Seems an enterprise when you get people saying it. This organization is, trouble, is troublesome, partly because of what it did, but partly because of how it was set up. Most of the members were Bosnian Serbs, meaning they were citizens of Austria. They lived in Bosnia, and whether they liked it or not, they were Austrian citizens. They didn't like it. They wanted to be, of course, Serbian. But the headquarters of the organization, the brains of the organization, and the equipment for the organization was controlled by people in Serbia, and chiefly by this man, known as Colonel Apis, Colonel Blagutin Dimitrievich, uh, chief of intelligence of the Serbian army, who in his spare time ran the Black Hand, along with a group of other people. And members of the Black Hand would go to Serbia for training, uh, for their cyanide capsules, for their pistols, for their hand grenades, for the pep talks, and then be sent back over the border with the connivance of the border guards in order to get into Austria, into Bosnia, and spread the word and recruit more assassins, etc., etc. This is the problem that Austria faced in 1914. How do you disentangle the Black Hand from the Serbian government? The Serbian Prime Minister is not a member of the Black Hand. The cabinet ministers are not. Uh, but they're scared of the Black Hand. They permit it to operate. They connive. They close their eyes. The situation is not unlike the situation in Afghanistan and Cuba and Burma, where most of the world agrees that getting rid of the Taliban in order to get rid of al-Qaeda, their clients, or the one they're partnering with, is a good idea. How would we have felt if the country that had these people in it was not in the middle of nowhere, as far as you can get from the United States, but, but was north of the Great Lakes in, in Canada? Uh, you can't blame the Austrians who wanted to do something about this uh, situation. The Black Hand, by the way, was not, by modern standards, a very effective terrorist organization until, until June 28, 1914. One of their members had tried to kill the governor of Austria, uh, of Bosnia around 1910, firing five shots at him, all of which missed. She then shot herself in the sixth round. Uh, but they were planning for greater things, and that's a good with an A for effort anyway. Uh, and of course, their moment came in June the 28th, 1914, the uh, heir to the Austrian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and his wife, Countess Sophie, visited Sarajevo. This was not a surprise visit. It had been announced well in advance. Uh, the Archduke was the Inspector General of the Austrian Army, and Austrian troops were conducting maneuvers in the vicinity. Uh, it was also thought that visiting Sarajevo would remind everyone that Sarajevo was part of Austria. He was in his own country. He was not visiting a foreign country here. Uh, he looked especially, uh, he looked forward to the day because his wife, whom he had had to, had to marry morganatically, meaning that his children could not inherit the throne and she was not of equal rank with him, was always slighted at the Austrian court, uh, but now she would be treated with the uh, attention that she deserved. In fact, one would agree, as it turned out. The uh, Black Hand was well aware that the Archduke was coming and sent seven assassins to trip him. Seven, armed with pistols and bombs and newspaper hand grenades uh, into uh, downtown Casablanca in Sarajevo. I have a map here, if I can get to it. Now, this requires probably more skill than I have with these machines. Let's see what happens to some of this stuff anyway. Uh, that one. Ah, yes. Here is downtown Sarajevo. The Archduke's entourage of four cars with the Emperor along, along the Telsway go down here and visit the town hall where the mayor and local dignitaries and Catholic archbishop and the rest would meet him. Then they were to go on a tour of the city through this historical city with narrow, narrow streets. Seven assassins, you see there's eight numbers, so I'll get a one with one plus. The Archduke's car goes down here. The first assassin, Nemo Dasic, is a high school student who's never murdered anyone before. He was recruiting locally. Three of them were recruited locally. He doesn't do anything. Uh, neither does uh, Sobrinovich. Sobrinovich throws the hand grenade. It misses. Uh, he either fell in the street or bounced off the folded back 
destroy the arch archduke's car. Or according to one story, the archduke caught it and threw it into the street. I don't believe that story. But it did this. It went off. It demolished the car and back. The archduke's driver, being no idiot, decided maybe he should get out of there. So they sped up and whisked themselves past all the other assassins and arrived safely at town hall. Uh, the archduke was a little upset. The people at the town hall didn't know what happened. They gave him warm welcome. Your imperial royal highness, welcome to Sarajevo. And we all rejoice to see you today. And he was there, what the hell? They tried to murder me outside. What sort of a city have you got here? Most of the assassins had panicked. They were running away. They were jumping in the river, which is only knee deep. They were taking cyanide capsules, which didn't work. It gave them bad tummy aches. They were being arrested. But one man, Quincy, who was standing here, kept as cool as the flock across the street were in the coffee shop here. He was very sad. No assassination today. At the town hall, it was decided that instead of taking the, historic, uh, the tour of historical Sarajevo, they'd get out of town by going back down like this and out. Then they could come back by another route, which was at the hospital where the wounded were. Uh, with typical Austrian uh, lack of efficiency, they forgot to tell this change of plan to one person driver of the car. And so the chauffeur went down here and began his planned turn, at which point the governor general of Bosnia, General Potiorek, tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, don't stop, we're supposed to you know, go down the street. He stopped the car, apparently the gears locked too. Gavrilo Princi, who had been standing here, suddenly the Archduke's car stopped right in front of him. He pulled out his pistol and fired two shots, and the shots heard around the world. Because with those two shots, he managed to mortally wound City Hall, one of the most famous photographs that's ever been taken. The presence worn by these men remind you of one third of the population of Bosnia or Bosnia. They get into the car and ride to Bosnia. Uh, first of all, they stuck the Archduke in the jugular vein, so someone hit the Countess in the chest. Uh, the assassin said he didn't want to kill the Countess, he was aiming for the uh, governor of Bosnia, Potiorek, who was in the back seat. For a moment, nobody knew what had happened because the car was making more noise than the pistol, but then the Archduke slumped over, he turned to his wife and said, Sophie, Sophie, don't die. Live for our children. And he says, you'll share with me this lady who's a little bit thinner. Blood came gushing out of his mouth all over his light blue uniform. And by the time they got them to a hospital, they were both dead. This was the man who did it, Gabriel Princi, 19-year-old, virtuous, uh, apart from any student, uh, who wanted to make himself famous. And I guess he did, as you won't tell me he was. That's the pistol that he used. How anyone could kill two people with two shots from this pistol is unbelievable. I mean, James Bond would have trouble doing that, but Gabriel Princi did it. Well, anyway, there it was. Here's the Archduke shooting that picture we gave him in his Life magazine. It went all the newspapers the next day. The whole world was horrified, but this is typical of the Balkans. They always murder their own king. Uh, what will happen? The question is, what would happen? Nobody knew what would happen. Was a crime committed by an Austrian citizen, whether he wanted to or not, inside of Austria. Therefore, it should have been handled as a normal criminal procedure. However, nobody really doubted very much that the Serbian Black Hand, the people in Serbia, were behind this. There was a feeling in Austria, indeed, that Serbia must be severely punished. Serbia had taken care of the Grand Anarchist with the bomb and the, and the dagger. Uh, and certainly Conrad von Herzendorf said, no, we have, we, we, surely this is going to fix those Serbs once and for all. The Austrian government, however, did nothing for a month between June the 28th and July the 25th. As far as the world, big wide world is concerned, nothing happened. And most people assumed, well, that's, that's it. The Austrians can handle it internally. The lovely cover, which has the summer of 1914, is so beautiful. Everyone was expecting that they should be sitting in the grass. 
But behind the scenes, the Austrians are trying to make up their mind. This was not easy. They've got two prime ministers. They've got a foreign minister who flips one way or another. They've got an emperor who's a little too old. Uh, they have investigations that carry out, figure out what exactly happened. And they have Conrad von Herzegovic as their favorite. But what did they ask the people of Germany? They asked Germany for help. And in one of the more famous events, the German government, the Kaiser had been on a yacht, had his cruise, he came home, there was this conference. Germany said, we will support Austria. Austria said, will you support us? And he said, will you support us in our action? And Germany said, yes. This was a famous blank check. You never do that. You never turn your foreign policy over to somebody else, especially when they're the, the senior partner of the alliance. The reason Bismarck wanted an alliance with Austria, one reason, is he could tell them what to do, and they wouldn't make some stupid mistake. Now the Germans say, we will support you without saying, what are you going to do? The most obvious question to ask. And this was the key German error of this, of this whole business. The Austrians then tried to make up their minds what to do. They sent a man named Dr. Wiesner, a forensics expert and investigator, to there to file a report. And in a week, he came up with as much information as he could. Now, I predict that on June 28th, so shortly thereafter, you'll be reading this in newspapers quite a bit. Papers will say Austria was unjustified in going to war with Serbia because their own report said this. In fact, there is nothing to prove or even cause suspicion of the Serbian government's knowledge of the steps leading to the crime of preparing it or of it supplying the weapon. On the contrary, the indication is not that this is to be regarded out of the question. The Serbian government. So Serbia was not guilty. But later on in the same report, it says this. Please read that as well. And this highlights the dichotomy between the Serbian government. The Austrian government finally decided to go to war with Serbia. They sent them an ultimatum, a 48-hour deadline. I don't have the ultimatum here. It's the longest ultimatum in the history of Ultimato. But my point is it was designed to be rejected. The last thing Austria wanted was for that ultimatum to be accepted because it, they wanted to go to war. The Serbian government came up with a re conciliatory reply that the Austrians ignored. They broke diplomatic relations 48 hours later. And on the 28th of July, one month after Sarajevo, Austria declares war on Serbia. Now, you can't undeclare war. This means there's going to be a war between these two countries. They order mobilization of the troops facing Serbia. The question now is, is this going to be a limited war in which Austria crushes Serbia? Austria was much stronger. Or is it going to get bigger? My own opinion is that Austria was perfectly justified in wanting to take military action against Serbia. But in doing this, they deliberately risked the entire peace of Europe because if Russia backed Serbia, this would start an avalanche. And they knew that, and they decided that rather than agree with a peace conference or talks or anything like that, they wanted war. This was a terrible, grave decision. In 1908, when they had taken Bosnia, the Russians had done nothing. Austria had taken Bosnia, the Russians had backed down. They did not help Serbia, they did not do anything to make a lot of noise because Russia was just recovering from the revolution of 1905, was setting up as a constitutional system. Uh, Russia was in no place to go, having been defeated by Japan, and the Russo-Japanese War was in no position to fight anybody. However, 1914 might be different. Maybe the Russians couldn't resist going to war again. So we now have the coming of the, of what was going to happen. The Russian government decided that the war between Austria and Serbia was not one they could sit by and watch. That something had to be done. In order to do anything to mobilize your military, you can't do anything by just talking. The Tsar did not want to do this. When his foreign minister, uh, Sazanov, and the chief of the general staff, Yoshkevich, finally put enough pressure on him to order mobilization, he signed the document and then changed his mind a couple of hours later before the telegrams had been sent, after which it didn't go follow him and said, wait, I'm getting telegrams from my dear cousin. Because by now the Kaiser had returned from his cruise where he had departed again after the conference on the 5th and realized these are really serious. That there's going to be a war. In fact, of course, there was a war between Austria and Serbia. Uh, we better do something about this. And now the Kaiser starts frantically trying to get the Austrians not to invade Serbia or to promise only to take Belgrade or to limit themselves in some way. And he's writing his, uh, his letters to his cousin, the Tsar, Willy Nicky telegrams, they're called, because Wilhelm and Nicholas had missed each other by the pet names they were related, in which uh, Billy is 
trying to get Nikki not to mobilize, and Nikki says trying to get Austria not to invade Serbia, uh, and the, 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 the Tsar was grasping at these straws until the general said, look, Tsar, every day we keep longer mobilizing than anyone else. Every day we wait, Austria gains an advantage, and finally the poor Tsar says, all right, mobilize. Well, when Russia mobilized, the Germans felt that they had no choice but to mobilize at once. They gave the, they gave the Russians a 12-hour ultimatum uh, to demobilize if it's impossible, and then they mobilized. Now things get very interesting diplomatically. In order to help the Austrians, the Germans have mobilized their army. And on July, August, excuse me, on August the 1st, on August the 1st, Germany declares war on Russia. No one's ever been able to figure out why they did it. They wanted, they said, to clarify the situation. They certainly did. In order to help Austria, Germany declares war on Russia while Austria and Russia are still at peace. That certainly helped, didn't it? But what makes it particularly ironic, what is the German war plan? In the event of a major war, we will invade France. That's how we'll help the Austrians against Russia. They didn't envision this happening. Well, the King of Belgium was sent an ultimatum asking to keep in mind if one and a half million Germans marched through his country. They promised not to step on the grass and to repair all of the immense damage. Afterwards, they had to get into France. And Albert of Belgium, a very popular figure, <coughs> said, no, we are a small country, but we will defend ourselves as best we can and mobilize his own army with the full support of the Belgian parliament. The Belgians had more unity then than they ever had since. I think it's one reason Walloons forgot their differences for a little while. So the Germans now embark on diplomatic blunders, which whatever their real fault for starting the war certainly manages to make it look like they started the whole war. Mobilization orders are now being posted all over the place. The French one, the British one. These were all printed in advance. There's a blank spot right there. The first day of mobilization is. They just have to fill in the date. So the reservists will know the first day of mobilization. Your reservist and your reporting day is day six. You know when you have to show up at the depot uh, to be shipped off to war. It, all, it went very efficiently in 1914. This was a British uh, reservist uh, mobilization order here. Soon posters like this were appeared all over Europe. This was the original that James Montgomery flagged with his fire drive and did the old stem uh, shooting. Lord Kitchener was actually painted on later, but you can see that description as well. Headlines began to appear like this. Because Germany, having declared war against Russia, decided to declare war against everybody else. <coughs> Here are the declarations of war after Germany on Russia. Germany declared war on France. Germany declared war on Belgium because they wouldn't let them through. And then on August 4th, Britain declared war on Germany. Now, this was questionable in the sense that they had no obligation to do this. The British Foreign Minister, Sir Edward Grey, was in a dilemma. The French expected help. The British had been holding secret military talks with the French, so secret that the cabinet hadn't been told about them uh, for years. Uh, the French expected the British fleet to protect their coast and then British troops to come across and assist them, but there was no uh, treaty that said that had to happen, and when Sir Edward Grey and Prime Minister Asquith told the rest of the cabinet, two cabinet ministers resigned because they were so angry that this had been kept for them. England could have stayed at peace. Whatever Germany was threatening, it wasn't England directly. But Sir Edward Grey's position I infer, he never dared to say this, but I'm pretty sure it's true, is this. It would be nice if there was no war, but if there is a war, we must be in it. We must not sit still while Germany gets stronger and possibly overruns France the way they did in 1870 in the Franco-Prussian War. But he had to go to Parliament and explain all this, and it was very difficult to do. It would be nice if the Germans would do something that would make the job easier. And voila. When Germany declared war on Belgium, British government could now take the position that they were enforcing the Belgian Neutrality Treaty of 1837, which they were, that they were defending the rights of small, weak people against tyrannical and powerful neighbors. This went down well. There were a few cynical people who suggested that this British concern with the rights of small nations and, and weak nations uh, was a sudden development. The Irish hadn't noticed much of that concern in the last 400 years. However, uh, we have to give them credit for helping the Belgians. On August 6th, the Austrians, perhaps remembering that they, they had forgotten something, declared war on Russia. And again, we have this happening here as well. This I just brought there for interest's sake. And so the war began. Uh, and so this thing had started that nobody wanted, uh, that nobody wanted at all. The
Germans further shot themselves in the foot when Britain declared war. The German Chancellor, Bethmann Hallweg, was so upset uh, that he uh, gave his famous little speech to the, German, the British ambassador. Uh, you are going to war all for just a word, neutrality, just for a scrap of paper, the Belgian neutrality treaty. And then in a speech to the Reichstag, the German parliament, uh, the uh, German Chancellor said, our invasion of Belgium is contrary to international law. But the wrong, I speak openly, that we are committing, we will make good as soon as our military goal has been reached. It's good to tell the truth, but sometimes maybe you shouldn't. And to admit to the whole world that you're violating international law is not when you turn and influence people. And so it has come, and it's a mess. It's something like that. Let me try to explain it very simply. Give me a second. of all of this, the Italians maintained their calm and announced that they were not going to help the Germans in the Austrian because the treaty, after all, that they had said if Germany and Austria have attacked, but it's Germany and Austria that's attacking everybody. So they stayed neutral. Uh, next year they joined the Allies on the other side. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so back on like the tenth slide, yes. so it's on that tenth scene where the British or French or the Russians are trying to contain the Oh the yeah. was, as you say, a great power and only uh, w did not take a hand in these things. And perhaps today we'd say, weren't we lucky? Yeah. It was a time when we could just manage our own economy. We had economic interests in Europe, of course, but there was no great feeling one way or the other. If you, had taken a, if you had taken a poll of Americans in August of 1914 about which side they supported, I think it would have been about equal because there were certainly many Irish <laughs> who were no friends of England and many Germans there in the Midwest especially who would have supported the fatherland descendants of Germans uh, and others who have supported Britain, but there was no perception of one side being evil or, or the other, as there was, say, in 1940, when most people thought Hitler was awful, except insofar as the Kaiser was looked upon as a rather you know, unpredictable replacement. But no, the U.S. had no... Uh, Woodrow Wilson and the Pope had a little competition for the next three years to see who could start a peace conference, but they both lost, unfortunately. Yes? Um, June 28, 1914, was an interesting day. Yes, the dog down. Yes, that's something I omitted. That's right. It was a national day of mourning among all Serbs. It wasn't a good day to visit. But, uh, um, from his point of view, did he learn about this man, this man, that one? Evidently not, because there were 50,000 Austrian troops outside of Sarajevo, and none of them were brought into the town for security purposes. They just had the regular fleet. Uh, there was no particular. Uh, going into what happened on the 28th and also this whole thing, uh, as I tell my students, it's like peeling an onion. There's always another document or statement or story or legend or da 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 da. You, you could go on forever trying to explore what happened here. Uh, I mean, historians have been <laughs> doing that for a long time. Uh, there's always something else. Uh, there were theories at the time that the Austrian government wanted him to be killed. Why else would they send him into Sarajevo, this hotbed of the Black Hand, so they'd have an excuse? And Franz Ferdinand was not popular with his uncle. That marriage he'd made, that morganatic marriage, was uh, very, very unpopular. But poor Franz Josef, uh, the, the poor emperor, I mean, this was a man whose wife had been stabbed to death by an Italian anarchist. 
whose only son and heir had committed suicide after shooting his teenage mistress in the murder-suicide pact of Mayerling, whose brother had been emperor of Mexico, put there by the French in the 1860s, shot by firing squad after the Mexicans regained control, and his wife, a Belgian princess, went mad for the rest of her life, which lasted into the 1920s, and, 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 and now this. I mean, it's just, poor guy. Um, uh, Austria. was it involved? The Ottoman Empire was involved because the Ottoman Empire hated the Russians. And once the Ottoman Empire had received the gift from the Germans of a brand new battle cruiser called the Goethen to replace the ship that the British were building for the Germans, for the Turks, but which the British confiscated uh, when the war started. Uh, because the Turks, some Turks wanted territory in the Caucasus in Russia, because some Turks wanted the Suez Canal, because Turkey was currently being run by a gang of crooks. That's the only way there were three of them. I can't describe them any other way. It would cease power in 1913 and had been impressed by the Germans. Uh, they decided they would launch an attack on Russia in 1914. They sent this German battle cruiser to simply bombard Odessa uh, without warning and start the war. Uh, Germany entered, uh, Turkey entered the war essentially because they were 